Hi everyone and welcome to this taster session for the SQE. It's lovely to see so many of you here. We've got 58 people in the room and still more joining. Um, my name is Emily. I am one of the mentors for the SQE at Barbary. Uh, so I'm going to be taking you through a, a few things today. I'm going to make sure that you understand what the test is. I'm going to make sure that you understand how the course works and we're going to do some sample questions as well. Um, whilst it's lovely to see you, I might suggest that you disable your video just to make sure that the bandwidth doesn't get used up and it doesn't interfere um, with your audio and the, the rest of the display. Because um, if we have 63 people now all sharing video, um, something is bound to go wrong. So if you can, it might be a good idea to disable your video. All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about what SQE1 is. Some of you may already have signed up for the test, uh, not for the test, sorry, for the course to get ready for SQE1. Others of you may still be thinking about whether you want to sign up for the course. So first of all, I'm going to make sure that you understand what the test is. So what it is that you need to get ready for. Um, then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how the course works and how it makes sure that you are test ready for November. And then we're going to do some practice questions. Um, Ahmed, thank you for using the text box, the, the chat and saying that you can't hear me. I suspect it's something with your audio setup, Ahmed. So you might want to just go and try logging in again and see if that helps. Um, for anyone else, as we go through today's session, I absolutely welcome your comments. Um, I'm not here alone. I've got Anna here from Barbary as well, who is helping me navigate your comments because there's quite a few participants. Hi, Anna, uh, 67 now. And so she will be helping me keep an eye on the text box. I'm also going to be using polls with you. So she's going to be helping me do all of that. So if you have any questions as we go through or any comments, then do let me know. There'll be two of us keeping an eye out. So hopefully I won't miss anything off. All right, so let's start then by looking at the test. So the SQE test, part one, um, as I'm sure you know by now, is a multiple choice test and it assesses what is known as functioning legal knowledge. Uh, in practical terms, it is a big test. You have got roughly 10 hours of assessing to get through for SQE1. And those 10 hours will see you answering 180 different questions uh, which cover the syllabus. So a lot of questions which gives the SQE1 test the opportunity to really assess your knowledge across a huge syllabus. Uh, and as we'll come to in a minute, you'll see that the syllabus is very broad. So Shah, I can see that you're asking, will the course pinpoint certain topics within the books that are examinable? Uh, so yes, the the course covers the entire syllabus for SQE1. So every single area that you can be examined on is covered by the course, and it's covered exactly to the right depth that multiple choice questions practically can assess you on as well. But I'll, I'll come to that a bit later as we look at the course in more detail. So a lot of questions then covering a lot of law. What exactly is the law that will be covered? I have put the summary of the topics or the modules or the areas, whatever you want to call them, of what is covered by SQE1 up on the screen. So you can read them for yourselves, but you'll see it's, it's vast. And basically it covers all of what you would previously have studied in the core modules of an undergraduate law degree. So all of those basic areas of law like contract, tort, land law, uh, crime are all covered but it also covers a lot of the material that you would cover on previously on the LPC as well. So the more procedural side. So if I take crime as an example, because that's my practice background, uh, what you will find for SQE1 is that you don't only need to know what the offenses are, which, are, uh, which is what you would have studied for your undergraduate law degree if you'd done one, but you also need to know what happens when you go to court Will they get bail? What evidence is going to be admissible? What witnesses can be called? What happens during the trial? 
what rights do the police have when they're investigating um, the criminal offence. So all of the bits that you would previously have done on the LPC and on the undergraduate law degree, they are all examined in this one 10 hour test. So that gives you an idea of the breadth of SQE1. And this is daunting. So I'm not trying to um, wrap it up in uh, a nice soft package for you. It's a very broad syllabus that you will need to be ready for all on the same day. So that the test will cover everything over the course of a few days in, in the same period. Okay, having set out that scope of SQE, let's have a, a bit of a think about what the test actually, how the test will actually work. So first of all, you need to understand that it's closed book. So that means that you will not be able to simply look things up. If you have the best books, you won't do the best job. Uh, you need to know what is in your book, books. You can't simply um, rely on them and look things up. Uh, the other thing that's really important to note is that it's assessed on the law as it stands at the date of the exam. So as things change, the assessment will change as well. Now, there are, uh, Kaplan, the test administrator is not going to be cruel in this. So if there is a major change in law, you think about at the moment with COVID, there have been huge amounts of changes very quickly to the law. So for example, uh, bankruptcy is different now than it was a few months ago because it has to be in order to stop all of these companies suddenly going into administration uh, or liquidation. So Kaplan makes adjustments if it's needed for things like um, rapid changes in law, but generally you'll be assessed on the law as it stands on the day of the exam. Now I can see uh, that Artyom, you're asking what is the SQE exam grading? That comes to my next point, which is that the level at which you are being assessed is that of a newly qualified solicitor. So what does that mean? That means that you need to be able to give preliminary basic advice. You need to understand the core principles across this huge array of subject matter, but only to be able to give preliminary advice, only to a basic standard. Um, because of the format of the assessment, it's multiple choice questions, it's asking you problem questions, so you need to be able to tell someone how the law will affect them. It is not assessing the background of the law, the development of the law, it's not assessing authorities, where the law comes from, whether it comes from statute or from case law, with a very few exceptions, all of that is completely irrelevant. All that matters is how the law affects a particular person in a particular situation. So that means that a lot of the legal content that some of you may have studied before, if you've done any legal study before, be that at A level or be that in a degree, that will not be assessed in this test. This test only looks at what the law is what the legal tests are and how it applies to a given practical situation. The pass mark varies, or it will vary, it hasn't started yet, uh, but it is likely to be around about 60%. So they will adjust the pass mark to reflect the particular assessment and the particular performance of the cohort. Um, and Kaplan have previously administered uh, a very similar test called the QLTS test, which also has a huge MCT test as a part of it, which is almost identical to SQE1, which Barbary has also um, for many years now run prep courses for. And there the pass mark has tended to be at 58 or 59 percent. So Mohammed, I can see that you are asking, do we need to know case law? And largely the answer to that is no, Mohammed. You don't need to know the names of cases with a very few exceptions. So for example, uh, the, the rule in Rylands and Fletcher is one that you may have heard of if you've ever studied taught. That is a case that is so famous that its name is given to a legal test. So there you might uh, have the test name given to you as a part of the question because it is the name of the test. 
but generally you don't need to know any authorities you just need to know what the rule is so that you can then apply it to a practical situation and Shah, I can see that you're asking, will the lectures cover every single topic from every single module, every single topic in criminal law, tort law, and so on? Um, yes, is the short answer. So everything that you have got in your workbook will also be covered by lectures. I know that because I had to record all of the crime lectures, which took a very long time. Uh, they are pre-recorded, but I'll come back to that in a minute when I come back to the course okay so i will i will give you more details on the lectures in just a minute when we get to the course layout okay so you don't need to know case law you don't need to know sources of law you just need to know what the legal tests are um for each question if you break it down you have roughly one minute and 40 seconds so that's also really important because you need to know how long you can spend reading digesting and analyzing and one of the things that the barbary courses help uh, will help you to do is to practice in timed conditions and to get better at using your time effectively so for example some of the questions you will find very easy you'll just go oh yeah i know that one it's b and you can do that maybe in 30 seconds so you'll be able to whiz through others you will not know the answer to and you will need to think about and you will need to read very carefully more than once that might take you three or four minutes it's very important that you don't spend too long on questions uh, which are difficult at the beginning of the test. You'll practice on the Barbary course, coming back to those questions, doing the easy ones first and then coming back to focus when you've got more time on the difficult ones. Okay, we've looked at the test now, I think, and you understand what's required. And I know that many of you have got questions about the course. So let's have a look at the course. Uh, Osha, you have just raised a very good question. So I will just uh, tackle that before I get on to the course. You ask, if you pass one paper but fail the other, do you have to resit both papers or just the one? So although there are two different papers, it is one overall pass mark. OK, so you need to reach the overall pass mark, which means if you score 80 in one paper and 40 in another, let's say that the pass mark is exactly 60%, you will still pass. It is just one overall pass mark. And Cindy, you ask about the test. Are all questions scored the same regardless of the difficulty? Uh, so they are all one mark questions, as I understand it, Cindy, but Kaplan have a complicated grading system, which is why they don't have one set pass mark. Um, so I would suggest that you have a look at the guidance that they post on their website as well regarding their um, marking system but effectively yes it will be one mark per question and the pass mark will vary depending on how difficult the test is assessed to be by them okay so the barbary course then what do you get from barbary to help you prepare for this well there are a few key components to the barbary course that i want to talk you through and they are the workbooks the lectures practice questions, your personal study plan, and your mentor. And those components together are what make up the Barbary course. So um, that is, if you like, the complete package, which is entirely focused on getting you ready for this format of um, assessment. So if we have a look, first of all, I'm gonna try and show you some screenshots, but the PSP is, not yet quite finished it is being released later this week so i don't have access to a perfect psp so apologies for this being slightly grainy and not very good quality screenshots so um all of your material will either be sent to you in hard copy in the term uh, for the workbooks you get those on paper but you also get them online so everything else aside from the workbooks comes to you through your personal study plan so that is your VLE, your online learning system, where you will log in and find everything you need in order to get ready for the test. It also has your workbooks on there. So let's say that you're traveling or you're on holiday, you don't want to lug your workbooks with you. You don't need to, they are also available through your personal study plan. Now, what you get on the, the personal study plan, first of all, is the workbooks. Now this is a bit clearer um, and you can see this is a couple of pages. I'll show you the next page as well. 
a couple of pages that are taken from the workbook on different areas. The workbooks are incredibly dense. They have been very carefully written to be entirely focused on what is examinable and not to focus on the un, un, uh, examinable material. So a lot of the books that you would have looked at before, if you've ever studied law, will have a lot of material, perhaps extract from cases, lots of authorities, all of which is not examinable in SQE1. So the workbooks that Barbary have written cover only the examinable material. It does mean though that every sentence in the workbook is gold, every sentence is examinable, and therefore you will need to spend your time on the course making sure that you understand every single bit of these workbooks uh, in order to get you ready for the test. And the other materials will help you with that as well, so I'll come to those in a minute. So the workbooks are designed to be user friendly. They've got things like flow charts, for example, you can see here. The other page that I've, I've got here to show you shows how they've got examples and exam tips as well to really help you consistently stay focused on what can be examined uh, and not get distracted. Uh, let's just have a look. I'm having a look at the questions in the textbook as we go through so I can try to address them as they're relevant. So Artyom, I can see when you apply for the Barbary prep course, do we have to separately register for the SQE exam? So I think the answer to that is yes, but I may just call in Anna here to double check that because Anna is the expert on all of the practical points regarding registration. But I do believe that you have to register separately for the exam and Barbary don't do that for you. Yeah, that's right. You would have to separately register. The registration, as far as I'm concerned, is not open yet, but will be in the coming months. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much. All right. Uh, OK, so the you can see the workbooks and they're very focused. I'll go back a couple of slides just to show you the other screenshots that I got. The bottom two, which are a little bit blurry, you can see one of those is me delivering one of the lectures. And as you can tell from my hair, they're pre-recorded, they're not live. Um, they were recorded over the last year or so. And so those are available to you right from the beginning of the course and remain available to you to listen to as you are working through the material in your own time. Now, the lectures cover the whole course from start to finish, all of the materials. Um, you can stop and start them. And as you can see from the middle picture, of the uh, bottom row. There are also lots of little cartoon videos to try and bring the material to life to help you understand it. So both the workbook and the lectures are designed to help you remain active in your learning and not to kind of zone out as is easy to do when you're going through page after page or minute after minute of a lecture. Uh, they vary in the way that they are presented to try and keep you active in your learning and engaged. They're also quite short. So each lecture uh, is maybe, well, I think the goal is for each to be about 20 minutes because that is how long a person can really focus and stay, um, pay attention for. Uh, so all, there are many different lectures uh, is the, the result of that. Rather than having a one hour lecture, you would have three 20 minute lectures to cover the same material to make sure that you stay sharp and focused and active in your learning and therefore really absorb the material in a more effective way. Okay, that's the workbook and the lectures. Now, I want to show you, this is a screenshot of the personal study plan as well. I've only got a couple, so I can't show you all of the functionality, but it will give you an idea of what it will feel like. This is the home page. Uh, that you would see as soon as you logged into the personal study plan. And you can see at the top right hand uh, corner, there are a number of routes that you can travel from the home page. One of them will take you to your messages. One of them will take you to your progress. One of them will take you to what you need to do today, what your list of chores is for that day. Say chores, exciting learning opportunities is what I should be saying uh, on your learning journey. So it tells you what you need to do each day as you work through, and it also shows you your progress. Clearly here, uh, there has not been any progress yet. There's not anything to do yet because the course hasn't started and the 
personal study plan has not yet gone live so therefore it is not yet um, active. What is really useful also to me as a mentor is this page. So part of the joy of the personal study plan is that it lets you track your progress. It doesn't just show you what you've done but it also tracks how well you did. So with all of the practice questions that you have to do, uh, it will show you what your score was. And so as a mentor, this is really useful for me. I would log in here to see, A, whether you've answered the questions and whether you've done the practice test, uh, that's the first step, but B, how well you did in each area. Did you understand contract law? If you did understand contract law, how did you get on with misrepresentation? How did you get on with remedies? Are there particular areas that are problematic to you? Uh, and it will really let me analyze what a student's strengths and weaknesses are. So likewise, as a student, it will really let you focus on what the problem areas are. And then you know, OK, I need to go back to that particular part of the workbook or the lectures to, to make sure that I understand it. So I'm just having a quick read at the chat to see what questions are coming in. Uh, do non-grads or civil lawyers need additional or in-depth content to understand the bigger picture? Is more content available on the online portal if you want to read more about a module or topic? Uh, so that's a really good question, Amran. And the answer is no, you don't need more material because the test that you will be sitting is the same. You don't need to know how the law came about to be the way this is simply because you have never studied law before or because the law that you have studied is completely different from a different jurisdiction. Um, you need to know what will be in that test or what law is examinable in that test and how it can be examined. So the material that you need for law graduates and for non-law graduates is completely the same. And so we provide completely the same material to both candidates. I think what may differ is how long it will take you to work through the material. So if you've never studied law before, you may want to take more time to absorb con concepts, say, you know, actus reus and mens rea, for example, than if you are a non-law graduate. Um, and for that reason, Barbary have got different length courses. So the 40 week course starts next week, and that is starting in January for the exam in November, but we also have a 20 week course and a 10 week course. So if you're thinking, well, this looks quite familiar, I know that a lot of the material will come back to me quite easily, then you might want to sign up for a shorter course. So, okay, um, I've shown you the PSP. I've talked to you about the workbooks and the lectures. I'm just gonna go back to the list of resources that you have. I just want to address you now on the smart technology. So the personal study plan is intelligent. And by that, I mean that it can adapt what material it releases to you, depending on how far ahead you are. So ideally, of course, you will keep up with the program as you go through and never fall behind. However, if you miss out a massive chunk, then the personal study plan can cut out some of the revision material allocated to you and make it easier for you to catch up uh, with where you should be. So it's a smart pl study plan that can adapt to where you are. Overall though, I think the two most important resources which you will absolutely need in order to get ready are the practice questions of which there are thousands or at least hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, certainly more than a thousand. Um, Anna, again, I don't know if I can defer to your knowledge here if you know exactly how many questions there are available to practice with, um, but I know for crime I've written 300 and that's just one area so there are many many hundreds of questions for you to practice with each of which is designed to look like the questions that Kaplan have drafted so as I've told you already Kaplan um, have previously been the test setters for a call for an assessment called the QLTS which is very similar to the SQE although uh, it is slightly not, not quite as broad, but is still a very broad assessment. Um, and Barbary have been preparing students for that exam for a, a number of years now and have built up a good understanding of how Kaplan phrased their questions. Uh, they've also, of course, participated 
in the pilots and utilized the material made available by Kaplan. So Barbary has created this bank of questions, which looks and feels exactly like the kind of questions that you can expect in the SQE1 exam. And it is doing those questions, which will be allocated to you through your study plan throughout the course, right from the beginning, that will really help you understand how the legal principles apply to a practical situation. So really those questions are not only your best guide on whether you are ready for the test, but they are also your best learning tool. We're going to do a few of the questions in a minute so you can get a feel for how they work. What's really important about these questions is not just that they are questions, but also that they give you answers. So with every question, you will have an answer that not only tells you which is the right option, but also tells you why it is the right option and why none of the other options are as good as the right answer. Ah, thank you very much, Anna. So there are over 2000 questions on the personal study plan, which is, I can tell you as a person who's written the crime ones, that's more than enough to cover the whole syllabus. It is really a very comprehensive set of questions. Um, and the last learning tool that you will have that I want to uh, advise you about is the mentor. So you will have a mentor who will be with you right from the start of the course to the end. So I will be a mentor to many of the uh, students on the course, but there will be others as well. Barbie has a whole team from which mentors are allocated. And the mentors are uh, very experienced in how Kaplan operates from their experience with the QLTS. And they will coach you right from the beginning. And the amount of support you get from them will depend on what you need. So I, as a mentor at the moment for the QLTS exam, will contact my students every couple of weeks to see how they're doing and to explain where they should be. And for many of them, I will have a fortnightly uh, session where we have an a online call uh, to check in how they are doing with their progress. Some students want more support than others. So for those of it that want it, I offer uh, study skill support, personal coaching, general encouragement. For some of them, I'm a, uh, a deadline to meet. Oh, I'm talking to Emily on Thursday. I've got to get my work done by then. Um, and for others, if they find the course easy and accessible and they just want to get on and study, all that will happen is that I will continue to send them emails and they can avail themselves of my um, offers of contact as they like. Now, in addition to having this regular contact with your mentor that you can choose how intense that is, um, your mentors will also be on a rota for office hours. So there is always a regular time period where you can check in uh, with someone and ask questions. There's also an online um, way called Fresh Desk where you can submit legal questions to get those answered promptly as well from the whole team of legal experts. So for example, my area is crime. I can easily answer your crime questions, but ask me about accounting, and it's not my favorite subject. Um, I and the accounting tutor and the rest of the subject tutors will all help answer the questions through Fresh Desk. So you've got a whole team of experts at your disposal to answer any of your legal questions as we work through the course as well. Okay. I think that covers everything about the course that I wanted to say. I'm aware that I have been neglecting the textbooks as we've been going through. So maybe Anna, can I um, just call on you at this point to say, is there any questions that I should be answering at this point before I move on to sample questions? Uh, yeah, there's quite a few questions actually coming through, but I think what we'll do is um, you feel free to keep popping those in and then we'll refer to them after we've gone through the questions. Okay. The event. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. In that case, let's give you a little taster of a sample question. Now, just before I put that sample question up on the screen, Anna and I uh, have agreed that we're going to do this as a poll. So we want you to actually answer the question, give it your best shot. I'm aware that many of you will not have studied law, um, so I'm not expecting you to know the answer to this. And if you get it wrong, that's absolutely fine. Remember, the MCTs are a learning tool. It's not about getting a pass mark right at the beginning of the course. It's about using MCTs to get to a pass mark by the end of the course. Um, so what I want you to try and do is use your powers of deduction. 
use your careful reading skills, use anything that you do know about the law so far, be that from reading, previous study, or even from TV or Google, um, to give your best guess about what the answer should be. The worst thing that you can do with any question is not answer it. That will automatically get you zero points. If you at least have an informed guess, that should give you more than 20% chance of getting it right. So it's absolutely pivotal that you try every question in the exam. And if you can try intelligently and rule a couple of the options out, that will help you uh, answer it better than you would if you're simply guessing at random. So I'm gonna put it on the screen and Anna's then gonna start timing it. And you will have one minute and 40 seconds to answer the question before we go through the answer. Okay, here we go. So first question, a man is charged at the police station with murdering his wife. And just in case you, your poll has popped up in the middle of the screen, you can move it so you can still read the question. Uh, the man, sorry, it's also popped up in the middle. The police remand the man in custody to appear at court. At which court will the man be produced? So a man charged with murder, which court will he go to? Remember, you've got one minute and 40 seconds to give your best answer. So try to have it answered by the end. Okay, you're one minute in. I can see that about half of you have tried now. You've still got 30 seconds. It's good to take your time though, if you're not sure, read the answers carefully and see if you can eliminate any of them. So take your time. You've now got 10 seconds, you're still 15. People still have to vote. <laughs> Two seconds, make sure you get your vote in. Oh, okay, so 61 people voted as far as I could tell. And here is the uh, poll result that you can see. So 31% said the Crown Court because murder is indictable only. 26% magistrates court. Uh, and then lesser percentages for C, D and E. Okay, I'm just going to see if I can close that on my screen um, and move the slide on to show you the answer. So the correct answer is actually B. So well done to everyone who chose B. Now, one of the reasons why I want to do these questions with you is to give you a feel for how you can try and eliminate answers which are wrong. Now, First of all, if you know the answer, if you know that all, all cases start in the magistrate's court, that's great. This is a super easy question if you know the answer. That's true of many questions. If you don't know the answer, then you can think about what you do know and think about what sounds implausible. So hopefully, I would say, you know, the fact that a defendant or that the court may vary where you have your first appearance, that sounds unlikely. Think practically, how would that work? When does the court decide if you've not yet had your first appearance? Um, it doesn't seem to really work in practice. So hopefully that kind of process of elimination will allow you to already remove C and E because having different courts for first appearances is not really going to work. So then you're just left with, is it gonna be the Crown Court or is it going to be the Magistrates Court? And I suppose, again, if you don't know the answer, it makes sense to think Crown Court because it's more serious, but then also think, how is it going to get there? Um, do you ever see scenes at Crown Courts, even if you've not been there on TV, with lots of different people waiting to get in? If you have ever seen any kind of court, any TV scene of people waiting to be called in in crowded waiting rooms, it's always at the Magistrates Court. So again, hopefully that kind of process of elimination can lead you closer to the right answer. And even if you don't get that one right, do that a few times with multiple questions that you're not sure on, and you've, you've got an increasing chance of getting at least some of them right, if you can 
reduce it from a one out of five chance to say a one out of three chance, you are already going to get 30% just by guessing the right answers out of those three. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next question. And hopefully, Anna, you can make, here's the poll again for the next question. So again, you've got one minute and 40 seconds to answer this one. A defendant is being tried for ABH in the magistrate's court. The case is being heard by a panel of three lay magistrates. During his evidence, the defendant attacks the character of the victim of the alleged offence, saying they have a history of violence. As a result, the prosecution wants to apply to adduce the defendant's previous conviction for ABH and assault. How will this application be dealt with? Okay, so again, have a look at the answers. Just reading that question has taken us 30 seconds into the one minute and 40 seconds. So you've now got one minute left to read the remaining answers and try and choose the right one, or at least try and reduce the wrong one so you've got a better chance of getting the right one. You've had one minute, so you've got 40 seconds remaining. I can see a few of you starting to vote. You've now got 20 seconds remaining. You've now got 10 seconds remaining. For the, so for those of you not yet voting, it's time to make your choice. Two, one, zero. Okay, so only 52 out of 71 voted there. It was a harder question. You can see that more of you wanted to use a time. Now you can see why it's so important to practice this in timed conditions. Okay, so the correct answer uh, here, I'm just trying to have a look, ah, is D. And fantastically, most of you got D correct, uh, got the right answer. So that's fantastic. Yeah, so the lay panel is going to hear the application. And then if they refuse it, they have to try and put what they've heard from their minds uh, to then hear the trial without considering what they know about the bad character. So that in itself doesn't sound like a very plausible answer. So how, if you did not know that that was right, could you um, rule out any of the others to increase your chances of getting the right one? So let me just move on to the next slide and we can have a look at how you can rule some of these answers out. So first of all, um, if you look at E, the admission of bad character evidence cannot be considered on the day of trial because it would cause delay. Now, in some ways, that sounds practical because the courts hate delay. You may have been reading in the news about how some cases are having to wait for four years at the moment because of COVID. So getting, speed, um, getting cases dealt with promptly is absolutely a priority. So that sounds plausible. But is it plausible that bad character can never be dealt with on the day of trial? Think about what that would mean in practical terms it would mean that defendants could say what they wanted in their evidence. They could attack every victim and say, you know, they are uh, violent, dangerous people and they always do stuff like this and nothing could be done to stop them if their own character was then not called into question. So, of course, it can't be E because it would give a blank canvas to defendants to say whatever they wanted. So you could rule E out by thinking practically in that way. Uh, A and B, again, what I was saying about delay and expense, think about how long the waiting lists are for the courts. Anyway, the application being heard by a different panel, uh, being adjourned to be heard, heard by a different judge. Again, if you think practically, you know that the courts would hate to have that as a modus operandi because it would cause more delay. And the whole setup of the courts is designed to avoid delay. Uh, so thereby, you've already hopefully been able to rule out three different options just by thinking practically. And so then you're left with two, which gives you a 50-50 chance. Uh, and so it gives you a better chance of getting to the right answer. So this is the name of the game, really. The first part of the course, of course, is about teaching you the law and making sure that you know what the right answer is. 
but it's also about teaching you question techniques. So if you don't know the right answer, you can increase your chances of getting the right ones by ruling out wrong ones. Okay, um, let's have a look at another question. So I will put one up on the, the slide, the, the next slide up with the next question. If I can get it to move on, there we go. Anna's got the poll up, thank you, Anna. So your time has started. Uh, the third question is a, solic a solicitor representing a client in litigation becomes aware that the client has committed perjury on a material point while testifying the previous day. Which of the following statements best describes what the solicitor should do? So again, 25 seconds gone, just reading that question. You've now got one minute remaining. And oh, no, sorry, you've had one minute. You've got 40 seconds remaining. Forty-four of you have already got to the answer, which is great. That means you know one minute, 20 seconds remaining. You can then add that onto the time that you've got for a difficult question. So 53 have voted, got four seconds remaining. Three, two, one, ah, <laughs> 58 voted, well done. Okay, so the correct answer here is B. And most of you got B, which is great. Um, but again, part of the process is not about getting it right. If you know it, great, but it's about learning how you can increase your chances of getting the right one. So how you can eliminate some of the answers. Now this question deals with let me just move the poll from my screen, deals with professional conduct. And so hopefully you, even if you don't know what the rules of professional conduct are, you will know that, or instinctively feel that there are a couple of duties at stake here. First of all, you've got a solicitor's duty towards their client of confidentiality and not to tell anyone what they have uh, heard from their client, but they also have a duty not to mislead the court. And so what do you do when those two come into conflict? Uh, the first option, immediately ceasing to act. I saw that almost none of you chose that. And again, that's a sensible choice. It's one that you can rule out pretty quickly because practically speaking, if you just think about it, there's got to be steps that you can take to try and remedy the situation, to try and avoid having to cease to act. So immediately simply saying, I withdraw um, is going to involve expense and cost. So, Logically speaking, there's going to be workarounds or, or attempts at workarounds anyway that you could consider. Um, C, hopefully you could think, well, yes, it feels right to tell the court what's happened, but on the other hand, you've got this duty of confidentiality, so that feels wrong. So again, hopefully you could rule that out by process of elimination, thinking that that seems like a, or it feels like a breach. Um, D, similarly, you could also probably rule out because it feels like a breach in the opposite direction. You try to persuade your client to tell the truth and then they continue to lie and you act anyway. That feels wrong. So hopefully, again, by thinking about what the duties are, even if you don't know the answer, you can rule out some of the options and thereby increase your chances of getting the right, um, the right answer. So Angela, you're asking where the sample questions have come from. No, they're not from QLTS tests because uh, QLTS questions are not released. CAPLAN do not release their questions. So, uh, and everyone that sits a test has to sign uh, an agreement not to disclose what was in the exam. It is a Barbary question. So it's been written by Barbary, but it does closely mirror the, the format and the kind of content that you would get in a QLTS question, but it's been written by a Barbary uh, tutor. 
Do all MCQs have only one correct answer or are there questions which have more than one correct answer? That's a really good question, Alexandra. Um, it is a best answer model. So uh, in fact, the next question that we're going to look at is a really good example of that. In that question, there are several answers which are not wrong, but there is one answer which is best because it's most relevant to the fact pattern and therefore um, it is the best answer. So you are looking for the best option out of five, not the only right option. So you can't say for certain that the others are wrong, uh, but you are looking for the one that is the best. So let's have a look then at the last question that I've got for you to try. Thank you, Anna, for getting the poll up. So here you can see just reading the question is going to take a bit longer. Two parties are pursuing the same contract to design a vaccine delivery system for a medical company. One party is a large pharmaceutical company and the other a scientist who has not pitched for commercial work before. Both parties separately consult the same firm to act on their behalf. Solicitors in separate branches within the uh, separate branch offices within the firm would act for each of them, and there is no other client conflict in relation to the matter. Because the scientist has not consulted a solicitor before, the firm is careful to fully explain the risks of acting for both of them. Each party is willing to confirm in writing that they want the firm to act for them. Should the firm act for both parties? So just reading that took 50 seconds. So you've now had one minute and 10 seconds, so 30 seconds remaining. Ten seconds remaining. I can see that fewer people have answered the question than normal at this stage. Good. 42, 45, and now time's up. Ah, so interesting to look at your timings when you were doing that because um, generally in the low 50s were answering. In that question, only 47 people answered the question, which is the lowest of any of the questions we've done. And I think it reflects that it's the hardest question, but it's also a really good indicator of two strategic points for MCQ tests. The first is answer every question. Because even if it's a, just a guess, you've got a 20% chance of guessing the right one. So always answer the question. The second point is that this question would be one that I personally uh, might flag to answer later. So when you're doing the test, you can flag difficult questions. And then at the end, when you've answered all of the easy questions, you can look at all of the difficult questions again and answer them then when you know how much time you've got left. Now, this question is long. It's quite factually complicated and it takes a while to understand what it's asking. And then it, it takes even longer to figure out what the right answer is. So this is one that I would flag and ask at the end. Uh, Ojido, you ask a really good question. Do you lose marks for incorrect answers? No, you don't. So it is one, uh, you get points for answering. You get nothing if you don't answer. You get nothing if you answer it wrong. So it is absolutely worth answering every single question that you do. Okay, so now let's actually have a look at the answer for this question. It's a really good example of how it is a best answer question. So the best answer here uh, is A. So some of you, I think most of you know that you cannot have a conflict of interest as a general rule. So the general rule is that you cannot act for two parties in the same matter, but there are some ex exceptions to this. So one of the exceptions is that you can act for parties in the same matter if, when they are competing for the same interest if they are both of the same bargaining power. Um, that competing for the same objective exception does not apply here because we were told that one is a scientist, the other is a major pharmaceutical company, they do not have the same bargaining power. And so you cannot act for both of them, even if they both confirm that they're happy for them to do so. Um, that 
exception to the rule of not acting for more than one party does not apply here. Now, it is the best answer because some of the other um, exceptions could also, some of the other exceptions are also um, referred to in the alternative answers, but the one that's most relevant is A. So A is going to be your best answer. Mohammed, you ask, can we go back to change the answer or is it that once we submit the answer, it is too late? So I would need to double check what the SQE setup is, Mohammed, but I can say that with the QLTS and with the pilot, the way that it works, and I'm, I'm fairly confident that the setup will be the same, is that you tick all of your answers, then you have a review screen where you can look at all of the questions that you flagged. And indeed, you can go back over all of your answers and change them. And it's only when you click on submit test at the end that all of your answers are final. So until that point, you could change everything. Um, but because SQE is new, that's something that I would always want to double check so that you get the logistics exactly right. But that's certainly the way that Kaplan have always run their test to date. And it seems very likely that that is how this will work as well. OK. That takes us through some sample questions. I hope that it's been helpful to you. I hope that you've got a better idea of what it is that you are preparing for, first of all. And I also hope that I've answered uh, some of your questions about the Barbary course and about how that can help you prepare for the SQE1 exam. Um, but Anna, now might be a good time to go back through any questions that have arisen, which I've missed whilst we've been um, doing the questions. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, before we actually um, go through any of the previous questions, there were just quite a few questions that came through about things like um, how to sign up for the course, okay. what are the recommended study hours, um, which course option to go for, etc. As you know, we've got three options. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is just pop into the chat a few useful um, resources just as a background. Great. Um, the upcoming course, which is the longest one that we've got, um, the 40 week course is actually starting on Monday and you can still sign up for that now. Um, and you can sign up through the uh, first link that I've just shared. And that also has the rest of the course options, registration, fees, study hours per week, all that information on there. And then the recording also of this webinar for those of you who joined a little bit late, will be at the end of today in the events and webinar section of our website. I've also added a contact us link, just in case any of your questions don't get answered in the next eight, seven minutes or so. So please don't worry about that and do feel free to contact us um, if there is anything that's outstanding um, that you have a question on. So some of them, um, some new ones have come through just now. Yeah, so William, I can see you asking, is it an online exam? Yes, it is. You'll be doing it in a, in a, on a computer. Um, probably if you've ever sat to your uh, car theory test in a test center, also used for that kind of assessment. So you'll be in a little computer booth um, all online. And let's have a look. Uh, Mohammed, I can see that you're asking, will the weekly assignments start with all the topics in FLK1 and then FLK2? So will weekly assignments be on one topic? Now, again, I need to put a bit of a proviso in here, unless, Anna, you have a definitive answer. Uh, my understanding is that we start with FLK1, but that we vary the topics a little bit to make it a bit more engaging for you um, and to make sure that you stay interested. So you'll be doing different topics simultaneously, but there'll be a focus on one topic. Yeah, so there will also come up again um, if, for example, you um, are struggling with one specific subject as well, you'll find that um, the questions assigned to you come back <laughs> mm. to try and get you to really um, kind of get the practice in um, and improve your score in that particular subject a little bit more. So for the purposes of a revision, the questions will vary. Um, and, but then of course the order of let's say the lectures or the uh, content is sort of preset in a certain way. And we obviously mm. recommend a certain kind of revision schedule um, through the PSP for that. Mm. And Ahmed, I can see that you're asking, is the computer-based exam in London only? 
Um, it will be administered through the Pearson centres, which are UK wide and in fact they're global, but it will be subject to where they are offering the particular test. So for QLTS, because it's an international exam, um, the online test is offered literally all around the world. Uh, we'll have to wait and see which centres Pearson is offering it for, but it will certainly be in multiple centres across the UK. Mm -hmm. I just uh, want to address David's question, just because it sort of touches on what I just uh, mentioned about the PSP, which he's asking, are the lectures released on a weekly basis or can we watch ahead of that particular week? So you effectively have access to the course. Um, we sort of do recommend, so the PSP will, it's kind of clever in that it will always assign you a certain set of materials um, that you will have to complete for that particular week. Um, and it's, in essence, if you follow that, you'll be sort of going through it with the right pace and a comfortable pace that we recommend. But if you happen to, for example, fall behind or the opposite, you find you're having a little bit more time on any given week, you can always just jump ahead or back as needed, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, so Ailish, is it best to do the 20 week course if you are a UK law graduate? Well, the 20 week course will still cover the same material. So it's a question of how intensely you want to study. If you've done a UK law degree, you may well feel that you will be able to grasp the material very quickly. But think back to what you did in year one of your degree. Do you still really remember all of those legal principles? I know I had to do some, some squatting up when I was revisiting all of this. Um, so think about how long you want to spend on it basically and whether, you'll think, whether you think you'll be able to do those undergraduate law topics more quickly. Um, in some ways, it's it's much more straightforward than the law degree because it is simply the legal principles. It's not all of the authorities in the background. But in other ways, it's very sophisticated because it is entirely problem question based. And so that might be quite different to what you've done at undergraduate. Um, and therefore, you may want to spend you know, have more time to get to grips with with that different focus on the law that you already know. William, you're asking whether personal tutors are assigned on the basis of your area of interest. Um, the answer to that is not no, and that is because your tutor or your mentor is literally there to coach and mentor you through the whole course, um, not into your area of particular interest. You do have access to all of the tutors in every single area through um, the, the legal question um, submission uh, portal, which is called Fresh Desk. So you will be able to access uh, every single subject matter expert with all of your questions throughout the course, not just in the weeks for contract law, you have contract law. You can ask questions throughout the whole course and access the whole team through that uh, forum. But your coach or your mentor is there to coach and mentor you through your studies. So they won't be allocated on the basis of um, interest. Any other questions you want to pick out, Anna? Um, there was just um, a few practical things about um, the book, such as um, it was far earlier, that, such as whether they're just in hard copy, or they'll be online as well. Okay. Um, I think Emily mentioned it earlier as well, but they will be available online. Um, in fact, you'll be able to also annotate and highlight online and things mm -hmm. like that as well. So they're both hard copy and online. Um, so that's just a practical point to mention there. Um, it's actually quite a few questions coming in and I know that we're just a minute away. So um, as I mentioned, do feel free to get in touch with us. We'd be more than happy to address your questions. We've got, you know, a live chat on the website. If you've already been in touch with a Barbary member, uh, team member, then they would be happy to answer. But if you haven't before, um, just follow through. I'll share the link again for how to contact us in the chat, and then somebody will be assigned to you and be able to answer all the questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll shall I just answer a couple more that I can see in the text yeah. box um, because you've still got time. So, Mohammed, I can see that you've asked, do you have a few weeks of study, or does the entire PSP plan cover the entire forty weeks if receiving receiving weekly assignments? You will have different assignments for each week. In the last few weeks, week six, uh, last six weeks or so, I think, you will have revision assignments. So at that point, no new material, but you'll be doing new 
um, MCT questions, for example, to review the old material. So you will have different assignments for every single week over the 40 week period. If you fall behind, you'll be able to catch up. You can access, as Anna said, the whole, uh, whole study plan right from the beginning to the end of the course, right from the beginning. So if you want to work ahead, you can. If you need to catch up, you can. You can access previous weeks and future weeks material as well. Uh, David, I can see that you've asked whether you will get further hard copy materials. Uh, the, the workbooks are the hard copy materials. Everything else is available through the online study plan. Um, remember, bear in mind that you will be assessed in one test on all of the legal content. And that means that you need to have it at a level that is manageable. So you, you don't want more detail than you've got in the workbooks. Like I said, every single sentence in those workbooks is key and is examinable. Um, but we've made sure that we haven't included anything which is not examinable, unlike in the materials that you've probably come across elsewhere. So it is entirely focused on the exam. Okay. All right, I think that's uh, just about wraps it up. Thank you so much for all of you for coming along and for playing along with the questions as well. I hope you found it helpful. And I look forward to seeing at least some of you on the course next week. And to others, I hope to see you in the future in the, the shorter courses. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.